because in part it was over the energy department wanting to bring in more waste to Hanford, to abandon waste in forever in the burial grounds that are leaking and in the tanks and the tank farms. And the energy department made a commitment in writing as a formal decision saying that it would only consider alternatives that remove 99% or more of all waste from the tanks. My question for energy right now, and then for ecology is, have you abandoned your commitment made in the formal adoption of the TCWMEIS to remove 99% or better from all the tanks just like you were proposing to abandon the waste in the bottom of the tanks. And for ecology, as a state legislator, I'd like to know why in hell the state of Washington isn't saying we have a position that 99% of the waste has to be retrieved. We applauded the Energy Department when they made that commitment. We're going to hold them to it. Why is it that we have a Department of Ecology representative up here? We don't have comments from ecology. We have comments from Oregon, which is weird. But why don't we have a commitment from the state of Washington that we are going to hold energy to the commitment which we applauded, that 99% of the waste had to be retrieved from the tanks for the final closure, not the initial retrieval process they've, they've been through, but for final closure? which would make all of this move. So let's start with energy. Have you abandoned your commitment? And then ecology. Yes. <laughs> I heard a lot of passion and a lot of experience and, and um, you know, long time frame for, I think, I think there's some frustration with the Department of Energy. Um, DOE has not abandoned this commitment. We are we are committed to clean these tanks to the extent that it's technically and economically practical. Um, <laughs> economically. Wow. That's not the statute. Well, to the best of our ability, it's technically and economically the practical. statute does not say economically. Uh, well, we are committed to remove the waste and look at the risk and make risk-based decisions that are protective of the workers, the public, and the environment. We welcome your comments. We're gonna, we're gonna work with expertise in the industry, with the regulatory commission in making that decision. Um, and, and we do hope that the department is reaching out for public comments. So we're not trying to do this in a vacuum. We're not, you know, we are, we are trying to be open and provide that information. You know what I say about trying. Let me just, let me just interrupt you and say we can answer. Okay, yeah. You made a formal legal commitment in record decision. 99% or better. And, for example, the department is saying to the public that Purex tunnels can be fully grounded and filled with cement and you can cut them up with railroad cars and then filled with similarly high level waste. So, just one alternative would be put two inches of ground in and cut it up and remove it. There have been a dozen other suggestions for retrieval of waste from the tanks to get to 99% or better. We haven't been through any process considering those. You're not considering those alternatives here. So, are you committed to following the formal statement adopted by USDOE in the Federal Register that you will retrieve 99% or better from the tanks. So the current TPA appendix size says a goal of equal or less than 360 cubic foot. The consent decree... the mic, please? Sorry. So the TPA appendix I says... Uh, equal or less than 360 cubic foot of residual volume. The consent decree that was initiated um, October 25th of 2010 says uh, equal or less than 360 cubic foot with two retrieval technologies or deploy the third retrieval technology. 
And then in closure, there will be a, a, a decision made with um, Ecology as the lead, as the regulator of, of do we need to retrieve more out of those tanks? But the 99%, as we understand that, is over the 149 tanks. We have learned a lot for these sea farm retrievals, and we expect that we will do better. Thank you for your question, Jerry. Um, and I just want to uh, make a key clarification in case what I said earlier was somehow misleading, but there's a fine nuance in there. The question that was posed on the panel about retrievals asked if DOE has met their legal obligations to date for retrievals. And the answer to that is yes, we have settled with DOE on that. However, retrievals are a part of what will be evaluated when Sea Farm is closed. And there is, as Chris has been saying, the potential that the legal obligations that have been met to date are not the full picture. We do not have all of the information at this time to make that closure decision. Thank you. Other, other comments and questions? And if we could please keep this civil, folks. Over here, you I'm Mikal Sepalainen, and um, I was on the board of Hanford Cleanup Board for almost 10 years, and the Hanford Advisory Board for probably half of that. And um, I'm so grateful that there is a meeting. I would like more meetings um, and more public comment meetings. I have a question. I hope it's a quick yes or no question. So is this redefining waste for all high level waste or just during the, in the sea farm? This is just sea farm. Okay, so um, I know that the definition for high level waste was originally not totally based on science and this and the definition should be revised by the NRC through more rigorous scientific processes. Um, so that's one comment. And I, I think it's exciting to, to, to have this conversation about redefining high level waste and the different kinds of waste because we really don't have a good handle on that and we're more advanced than we were when we came up with those definitions. So I think it should be an ongoing conversation and not done in this context with the sea farm. Um, and um, there's gonna be 63,000 gallons left and 472,000 curies of radioactivity. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. So that's just too much cumulatively. Like if you think of it's like each a, two, a little bit in each tank, like that's not a lot. Each tank, okay, but when you put it all together, that's too much um, to be left in. And I do actually just, I, I love what um, the Senator said over there, but I wanna actually disagree and say that um, you individuals are who we pass the baton to, to send the message and we need to trust that you're gonna go and say that we're not, we're not getting this. And say, let's start over or let's do this better and find better, cheaper technologies. So it is on your shoulders, it's on the leader's shoulders, even though the DOE leadership changes so often. They are making history, we're making history. And you can't forget that because individuals are part of it. The institution is part of it, is, is the backbone of it, but the individuals are what keep it going. And so I want, I ask you to go back to the meetings and say, this isn't good enough. Um, and um, I, I ask for more public comment meetings, uh, state of the site meetings, please tell them that. Um, and I have a question about 
what is the urgency for closing these? I know there's probably uh, milestones and everything, but instead of rushing to grout, there's so much technology is coming up so quickly. And can we can we say there's other priorities that you know we need to work on the WTP, the pretreatment facility, all that, and um, maybe put this on hold for a couple years, not redefine it, not use that as the basis. Because that that's um, not the not the right um, foundation for it. So my my I do have a question. What is the urgency? Thank you. Uh, I just turned that off, so it's not going to want to back up. So the question is, I heard it. What is the urgency? of this um, 74-year-old tanks. And I want to explain that I've been in that farm for 15 years, going through that farm with the workers. I'm not uninvolved with those workers. Um, the second is uh, there is a TPA milestone to close your seed farm. And it's uh, right now has, has a published date of 2019, which obviously we're not going to make. And that's up for negotiation right now with, with the Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, those are, that's a requirement to do that retrieval. I did want to ask, while we had discussion, I think I heard, why are you doing what you're doing? And Jeff, Jeff Burright had a, a, if you have, go through the three weird criteria, and you go through that process, it's appropriate to designate that waste as low-level waste. A closure decision may mean that low-level waste still has to be removed, treated, disposed of, or the tanks or the equipment. And again, those closure decisions have not been made. This is based off of those three criteria. And I encourage you, Jeff, I think your presentation will be on the um, Oregon website. Yeah, on the yeah. Area. yeah. yeah. I encourage you to go. Uh, Jeff gave a great presentation. I'm a little jealous. I wish I would have done that. I'll be honest with you. I think it's very good. But um, the three criteria is is our requirement to uh, make the designation for the for the waste, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, if you if that doesn't make sense, please provide that in comment. We don't. We took that seriously. We are listening to the comment. Before you hand the microphone off, I'm not shutting down or anything. Before we lose any more people, I, I do want to ask you all a question. Uh, this is the first time we've used this venue. Uh, I know other groups have used it before. Is it a show of hands? Is this a pretty good place? Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll definitely keep this in mind in the future. And uh, for anyone else who does leave, thank you very much for coming. And we'll, we'll have a few closing comments when we're there. But go ahead. Thank you. My name is uh, Lloyd Marbat. I am the executive director of the Oregon Conservancy Foundation. I'm appearing here on behalf of myself and the foundation. The comment that I'm, I, I have three questions which I would like to ask. Um, but before I ask those questions, I have a couple of comments. Um, and this is unusual for me. I've been in a number of proceedings with the Oregon Department of Energy over the years. And I don't think I've ever said this before, but I must say that I very much appreciate what you have done this evening and the concerns that you have specifically raised. My hat's off to you. Um, that's the first thing. Secondly, I want to join in the opposition to the truth decay and the eloquence of the other people in this room. My hat's off to you also. It's, I'm getting old, don't know how much longer I'm going to have, but I am happy to see that there are other people who are willing to stand up and speak to this tragedy that's been in our midst for way too long and will be there for a lot longer. Now I'd like to go to my questions. 
The first thing that hits me in listening to the presentation this evening is this concept of modeling risk. I, I'm blown away by this. I mean, this has been going on for a long time. I've seen it in other licensing proceedings. I know how this goes. But you know, it's just amazing to me. I listened to the, the, the description of this model, and the first thoughts that enter my mind are two events that are going to greatly impact the Pacific Northwest. One of them, the subduction zone off the coast of, of Oregon and Washington, where we are going, and it is projected to cause eventually a tremendous earthquake activity, which is going to reach far inland. I haven't heard anything about whether, in whatever these risk assessments are, that this event has been analyzed. How is it going to impact those modeling uh, processes that are going down? And then the other is the big, huge gorilla in the room, climate change. I, I, I'm just amazed that we're sitting here talking about some model that, in fact, really is not looking at the drastic changes that are already starting to happen in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, it blows me away. Because I think it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a paper thing. It's like, it's like a road map that really tells you nothing about the reality of going down the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's basically what I see here. And so that leads to my first question. Are those natural events being considered in any of these processes that are going to examine what to do with the waste that's left over at Hanford in the sea tanks and everywhere else, is it? Where does that enter in? Have you guys looked at climate change? Have you looked at the earthquake activity? You have? Yeah. Really, where's that analysis? It's in the, it's part of that 19 You considered the subduction zone earthquake in that analysis, did you? Uh, no, I, the oh, head's not I'm going not. yes now. Actually, why would you let her answer and if you pull the mic over? The Department of Energy is required to look at long-term um, features, events, and processes that can interact and change those activities, changes in rainfall, floods, earthquakes, and okay. that's something that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will be technically looking at as an independent agency before the department makes its decision. So yes, we Before the department makes its decision on the sea tank routing? Yes. I see. So you are going to factor in all that, but you haven't done it yet. No, it's, it's part of our analysis, and it's, it's up for comment um, and, and being reviewed by a technical, independent technical expert. So you published something now that shows how those events are entering into your proposal to put this route in the sea tank. Yeah, our risk analysis does factor that into consideration. So it's explicit. I'll be able to look at it in some document that you've got, right? Yes, we have. We have. The performance you didn't send it to me. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> it's available on the website. Oh, okay. 